At the beginning of October, King David II began his incursion into Northern England with approximately 12,000 men armed with weapons and armour supplied by France and assisted by a small number of French knights. The Scottish vanguard, led by William Douglas, arrived at little strength on the morning of October the 6th. This was a wooden Mott and Bailey fortification near Carwinley, about 10 miles north of Carlisle which was then under the command of Walter de Selby. The King and the main army arrived by the evening. No attempt was made on the fortification until on the fourth day, when according to the writer of the Lanacost Chronicle, they assaulted from all quarters, and those within and without the fortress fought fiercely, many being wounded and some slain, until at length some of the Scottish party furnished with beams and house timbers earth, stones and fascines succeeded in filling up the ditches of the fortress. Then some of the Scots, protected by the shields of men at arms, broke through the bottom of the walls with iron tools, and many of them entered the said fortress in this manner, without more opposition. Knights and armed men entered the fortress, killing all whom they found, with few exceptions, and thus obtained full possession of the fortress. Walter de Selby was captured, and the English chroniclers agree that King David behaved poorly to him, but differ on the details. In Geoffrey Le Baker's versions of events, he was brought before the King and pleaded for mercy and to be ransomed. The response was to have two of Selby's sons strangled to death before his eyes, before having the father beheaded. The fortress of a little strength was never rebuilt. It was at this point in the campaign that William Douglas is said to have advised David that it might be wise to turn back, but the king ignored his advice and led his army southeast towards Carlisle. This city and the surrounding countryside were to be spared by the payment of 300 marks, but the Scots ransacked the Augustinian Priory of Lanacost, where the Lanacost Chronicle declared, the Scots entered the holy place with haughtiness threw out the vessels of the temple, stole the treasures, broke the doors, took the jewels, and destroyed everything they could lay their hands on. In addition, they took some of the priors captive, one of whom was ransomed for money and fourscore quarters of corn as late as 1386. From Lanacost, the army advanced eastwards along the River Irthing and then probably along the South Tyne to Hexham. On the 14th of October, the Scots ransacked the Augustinian Priory there and damaged parts of the town, although they generally left it intact following the order from the King, which forbade its destruction. They encamped at Hexham for three days before moving further eastwards, marching on Aden Castle near Corbridge which surrendered to save the lives of the inhabitants there. It was then badly damaged. From Corbridge, they followed the River Tyne east to Wrighton, 
probably crossing via the ford at Newburn. And plundered County Durham on their way southwards to Ebchester. From Ebchester, it was easy to follow the Roman Deer Street to Lanchester, and then eastwards to Durham. They arrived at the Moor of Bear Park, just to the west of Durham, sometime in the afternoon on the 16th of October. Here they halted and drew up in their battle lines, but then wheeled about and descended upon the Prior's Lodge at Bow Repair, where they pitched, as the Ladder Cross Chronicle describes, tents of the richest and noblest sort, the likes of which had not been seen in these parts for a long time. The monks of Durham quickly offered the Scots £1,000 in protection money to be paid on the 18th of October. The Scots invasion had been expected by the English and as soon as the Scots crossed the border, Queen Philippa, the wife of Edward III, who was acting as regent in his absence, ordered William de la Zouche, the Archbishop of York, to assemble an army to oppose the Scots. The assembly point was to be at Richmond in North Yorkshire. About three to four thousand men were assembled there from the northern counties of Cumberland, Northumberland and Lancashire. Lancashire itself had contributed 1,200 bowmen and a small number of lightly armed border cavalry. A further 3,000 Yorkshiremen, including many longbowmen under the command of Sir Thomas de Lucy, were also on the march. On the 14th of October, not waiting for de Lucy's command to arrive, the Archbishop's army began the march northwest towards Barnard Castle. Keeping to the south of the River Tees, they arrived at the Premonstratensian Abbey at Eggleston, just southwest of Barnard Castle, on the evening of the 15th, and here they stayed overnight, and it is said managed to cause considerable hardship to the White Cannons of what was a relatively impoverished establishment. The next morning they again marched northwards, crossing the Tees at Barnard Castle, and then northeast towards Bishop Auckland. Undoubtedly, the route of march was along what is now the A688. By now it was estimated to be a force of 7,000 armed men. The Lanacos Chronicle states that it was under the control of Sir Ralph Neville. The march passed through Staindrop and West Auckland. and finally up the old Roman road that is marked by the course of Bishop Auckland High Street today. On their arrival at Bishop Auckland that same evening, they encamped for the night on a wooded hill in the Bishop of Durham's hunting park. This is still a wooded area to the north of Bishop Auckland and adjacent to the modern golf course and known as High Park. Events on the morning of the 17th began with the English army confessing itself at Bishop Auckland before moving northeastwards to Durham, probably via Middleston Moor on Kirk Merrington. Meanwhile, a Scottish force of over 500 men, led by William Douglas, had set out southwards on a foraging raid. The Scots crossed Sutherland Bridge to the south of Durham, continuing in the direction of Ferry Hill and Merrington. Somewhere in this general area of medieval moorland, the two forces clashed for the first time that day. The Scots fled and headed swiftly back the way they had advanced to rush news of the approach of the English army, all the time pursued by the English knights and men-at-arms. A great number of Scots were killed at or around Sunderland Bridge, whilst others, including Douglas, raced back toward the Bear Park. Whether this is in the area of the village called Sunderland Bridge, or the actual bridge, of which the old medieval bridge that is still in existence and carried the Great North Road across the River Weir is uncertain. Perhaps the bottleneck to get across the narrow four-arch bridge across the Weir resulted in the clash. 
It was also at this time that two monks arrived at Bear Park from Durham in an attempt to broker peace. But David II, thinking they were spies, or as they were described, false priests, ordered their beheading. However, they escaped during the ensuing chaos when Douglas arrived at the Scottish camp and warned the king of the advancing English army. David's attitude is said to have been disbelieving that a large English army was approaching. Nonetheless, he readied his army and marched towards Crossgate Moor, just outside Durham. Of the battle itself, almost nothing is certain, including its precise location, apart from stating that it was fought in the area of Neville's Cross and the Red Hills, to the immediate west of Durham. Neither is there any certainty to the size of the English and Scottish armies deployed. What can be said is that because of the superior position of the English, it seems certain that they arrived and deployed in the most favourable position on a narrow level plateau with slopes to either side, especially that falling away to the River Brownie. The Scots position, slightly to the north, was much poorer, having in addition the land sloping upwards towards the English line of battle, the steep slope down to Durham, and a deeply undulating ground sloping towards the Brownie Valley, a feature which was to cause problems during the battle. While the armies assembled in their divisions, a small group of ecclesiastics from Durham came out to the Bronze Age Mound of Maiden's Bower to the Scots' left flank, bearing the relics of St Cuthbert and praying for an English victory. Fortunately, despite being behind the Scots' line during the battle, they were left unmolested. Both sides drew up in three divisions. It is generally agreed that the first Scottish division was led by King David, the second by John Randolph, Earl of Moray and Sir William Douglas, and the third by the King's nephew, Robert Stuart, the Earl of Athol and High Steward of Scotland, with Patrick Dunbar, the Scottish Earl of March. On the English side, things are left clear, and one source even claiming that Queen Philippa rode on horseback and rallied the English soldiers prior to the battle, although this is rather fanciful. In what was to become an encounter lasting from noons until vespers, both sides fought so strenuously, bitterly, and very fiercely, using swords, lances, bows and axes, that several brief truces had to be agreed to allow the combatants to recover. The Battlefields of Britain website offers the following guide to the battle. The English were formed in three divisions, led by Neville in the centre, with Percy to his right and Rokeby to his left. Behind them, the cavalry was held in reserve. The Scots were formed, as described above. The battle started at about the third hour, when the English advanced their archers to harass the Scots in their formations. John Graham, the Earl of Monteith, offered to take 100 cavalry forward to engage the archers, but he was denied permission. He is said to have attacked by himself having his horse shot from under him and almost failing to make it back to his own lines. The Scottish right under Sir William Douglas began an attack on the English left but the lay of the land and the valley in front of them caused disorder in the packed ranks. This severely hampered their advance and led to them veering to the left. This delay was exploited to the full by the English archers. In the face of an arrow storm Douglas's disarrayed advance made contact with the English line, but they failed to make much progress. The Scottish centre and left divisions, with better ground to advance along, fared much better, and after forcing the archers to withdraw behind the men-at-arms, both were able to push their English counterparts back in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. At this point, the English committed a significant number of their cavalry to the fight. The flat ground of the plateau and a slight downhill slope suited a cavalry charge and they hit the Scottish left, the largest of the Scottish formations, 
pushing it back and allowing the English line to stabilize. This was followed by a general cavalry charge, which drove the Scots right backwards as well. With the English appearing to be winning, and two divisions pushed back, Stuart and the Earl of March chose to withdraw from the field in a disorganized fashion, which quickly turned into a rout. Douglas's division too was in retreat. In the center, the King's division was surrounded with Fort Ol, perhaps for as long as three hours, until his force was severely depleted. David himself had suffered a couple of well-documented arrow wounds during the battle, one of which was to the face. With the arrival of additional English reinforcements under Lord Lucy, the remaining Scottish troops surrendered or fled. The day proved to be an overwhelming victory for the English, whose own fatalities were described by Prior Fossa of Durham as few. While many valiant men of Scotland were slain, and lay strewn about over the moor of Bear Park, miserably exposed. As was usual for the times, many were captured for ransom, including King David himself, who is said to have hidden beneath Alding Grange Bridge, where he was captured by the English squire, John de Coupland. The Battle of Neville's Cross is an important but almost forgotten battle, which finally secured England's northern border, and, according to John Fosser, brought to an end the pitiful discord which prevailed between English and Scots over the course of many years. It is true that following the Battle of Neville's Cross, County Durham was to remain free of further Scottish military incursions until the Bishop's Wars almost 300 years later. King David's release was finally negotiated in 1357 for a ransom payment of 100,000 marks spread over 10 years. When he died, in 1371, the king left no heir, and he was succeeded by his nephew, Robert Stuart, Earl of Athol and High Steward of Scotland, during the king's captivity. The same nephew who had deserted him on the field at Neville's Cross. The area of the battle remained rural until the 1850s, when a deep cutting was excavated for the railway to run through. Today, the site of the battle is mostly covered by houses built in a series of developments through the 20th century. A cross had stood at Neville's Cross before the battle, placed at the spot where Durham Cathedral first came into view on the Pilgrim Route. After the victory, Lord Ralph Neville paid to have a new cross erected at Neville's Cross to commemorate the battle. In 1589, the cross was broken down and defaced by some lewd and wicked persons, leaving only the stump that we see today.